Welcome to the Information Security Forum podcast. I'm your host, Tavia Gilbert, and this podcast is the first of two episodes featuring ISF Managing Director Steve Durbin in conversation with Andre Krehel. So when you wake up in the morning, did you think you're going to die today? Hopefully not. Yeah, I, no. I'm not planning on no. it either. No, no. See, so that's that's how the company operates too. They just don't wake up in the morning and thinking this is the end of the digital world as we know it. That was today's guest, Andre Krehel, the CEO and founder of LIFARS LLC, an international cybersecurity and digital forensics firm specializing in remediation and resolution services. In the first of these two episodes, we'll be talking with Andre about how his company helps businesses and individuals respond to what he says is inevitable, the breach of data security. Our firm specializes in incident response and cybersecurity, meaning that we help the victims when someone compromises or hack their network to investigate and properly remediate the incident. You can think of us almost like the cyber emergency room at a hospital, right? So we perform very special type of operations, and then those patients move into the hospital and a rehab. And we walk with that life cycle of that cyber incident for those entities and walk them through every piece of that experience. So is it business to business, or are you working with the lay, lay person? Would you be working with me? Uh, it can be an individual. We have, for example, right now, a very high-profile political consultant to parties in power, and he's going through some digital debt type of experience. So we try to get him out of the digital debt. Um, and the beauty is, you know, we can die multiple times in a digital world versus physical. So we try to get him alive, right? It's like a Schrodinger cat, right? So dead and alive at the same moment. Uh, so we get him alive and then he goes back dead. So it can be individuals, it can be an enterprise. One of, one of the things, uh, Andre, I suppose that we all have to come to terms with today is that the breach is not something that, that may happen. It's something that will happen. It's, it's a, just a matter of time, really, before either as an individual, your identity is, is stolen or your personal information is stolen, or as a corporation, that there is some kind of a breach that uh, has a significant impact on the way in which you deliver service to customers. Walk us through a little bit some of that sort of forensic investigation. You know, what, what is it that happens? When do you get involved? So the phone rings and you get a message that says, you know, Andre, we've been breached. Take us through the different steps from there. Perfect. So our number one service is basically that contractual cyber 911. So that's mm -hmm. a 60% of a business is really the cyber 911, right? So the taxpayers pay for 911 and cyber 911 doesn't exist. So private companies like us, that's how our market space was created. So to your point, it always starts with a phone call. There's a phone call. Usually, so some of our clients do have uh, direct numbers, and they call the number that is assigned to their contract. And then we have a general line, right, where people basically go and report the cyber incident. So for some of the clients who have been already breached three or four times, I tell everyone it's like these beautiful things like that everyone wants, right? So it will just happen them again because they have something that someone else really badly wants. They will be hacked again, and there will be different type of a hacking that's going to happen to them. When the phone rings, those who have been going through that experience, they already do understand the process, and we have a protocol set up. Okay, so we'll help you. Now we access the remotely the system. Uh, we start accessing their enterprise systems. We have what I call the evidence preservation and collection process. So we do, do understand in the U.S. there's something called federal rules of evidence. So we actually, for us, everything is the evidence. We treat it as a crime scene. Right? Right. So we have a protocol for preserving that evidence. Right. So if I want to compare to a hospital, like a very special laboratory, right? They take your blood and blood is being sent somewhere. Right. So that's what we do. Mm -hmm. So we have these individuals that we send on site to collect those samples and then bring back into the forensic lab. And in a forensic uh, lab, we have a three-step process, basically, to analyze the evidence. Right? The last component is, imagine like you go to a doctor and say, I don't feel well. I've got this deadly virus. I think I'm going to have this deadly virus. Right? So we basically go through basic scanning, like a CAT scanning, right? the scanning the computers. Then we go a little bit deeper, maybe do some operation. And then we go to literally this DNA type of analysis, really every gene basically tearing apart, and that's what we do. So we, for example, in uh, nation state type of attacks, we go to the memory, the brain, right? Like your brain, little brain of a computer, and we tear apart every process. We're looking for any injection 
of what we call the implant in that process. Very tedious process. We do use a lot of tools, right? Like a doctor's, a mm-hmm. lot of tools. But it really comes with that surgeon skill set, precision of the surgeon. How quickly can you get to the issue? And, and how long does that sort of process take? I mean, I know it's a bit of a sort of, you know, how long's a piece of string type uh, type question. But for organizations, again, who might be listening to this and, and really trying to get their heads around the level, I suppose, of disruption that they might need to go through, because it is a disruptive process, right? It is very disruptive process. So I would say right at the beginning, in the first day, we do have understanding what the threat actor actually is, right? So it's almost like from what kind of impact threat actor going to have on an organization. Is it just Samson or ransomware group, or is it a nation state? Is it just some smart individuals who basically were able to somehow uh, gather some information from a system and abuse them? But generally, I would say in the first day, we do understand what is we work against. Right. right? And it, for us, it's very important. We've done over 120 investigations last year. I'm not counting like the small ones, mm-hmm. right? Not the small ones. From which 40 to 50 were ransomware type of attacks. So we see same pattern, for example, same criminals, right? Or same nation state groups exploiting a certain way the systems. And we do understand how deadly some of those groups are that do operate in the waters. It's almost like, imagine you are a marine biologist, and you want to name all the sharks, mm-hmm. right? That's what we're doing. Okay. We try to understand all the sharks in a cyber ocean and how deadly they are and how quickly they're going to eat you, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and once you've identified the, the, the particular shark and... and uh, um, cyber shark, right? Cyber shark. <laughs> how, how long does a, does a cleanup take? Imagine tomorrow we go for a knee surgery. And sure, you want to be running next week. Mm-hmm. Well, it's not going to happen. Right. right, you end up in an emergency room because you, it was an accident, right? and it's just us. Then you go to this hospital, and they're going to hold you in a hospital for a month, and still they're going to control you, and then you go to this rehab for a year. Mm-hmm. So cyber incidents are no different. Right. So get you out of the emergency room, and get you out of the mode where you can die, right? it might take two days to two weeks to a month, mm-hmm. right? and we get you out of the emergency room. You know, the cyber hog and cyber oxygen, you know, it's, you're good. Then we put you in a hospital. The cyber hospital, right, with all these tools. And you still have to be monitored. Mm-hmm. You just can't be let go. Mm-hmm. And that might take, you know, from month to another year when that patient, the cyber patient, has to be monitored and, you know, live under cyber supervision. Right. And then he still has to go through his rehab, right, right? to be fully op- operational. And that's, so the environment goes down over a period of time. But I would say every company needs around two years to reco- fully recover from event, incident, or data breach. Right. And, and in your experience, Andre, how many companies are actually prepared for that? So how many people that come to you and say, OK, Andre, you know, we've been we've been breached. How many of them, when they do that, understand this process that you've just been explaining to us? So when you wake up in the morning, did you think you're going to die today? Hopefully not. Yeah, I, no. I'm not planning on no. it either. No, no. See, so that's that's how the company operates, too. They just don't wake up in the morning and thinking this is the end of the digital world as we know it. So I don't think anyone is prepared to die today in a digital or normal world. So that then has implications, doesn't it, on the way in which a company itself is going to be able to respond? Because if you're not planning on it happening, then you don't necessarily have any of the response mechanisms in place. And, and, and certainly that's something that I've been talking a lot about on these podcasts. And so I'm really preparing for the day that you hope never comes, but you actually know will. And so do you provide you know, support, assistance to organizations that recognize that at some point they will die? And, and so do, you know, to keep with that analogy, want to get their will written and want to prepare for their funeral and all of that kind of thing? Um, definitely. So the proactive kind of like incident response toolkits are what we call like a tabletop exercise, right. right? So in the cyber military, what we practice, we practice the warfare and mission every time, right? We want to be ready to be deployed. Mm-hmm. And more, some of the companies do have some type of mindset. So they basically practice four or five times in a year this cyber crisis, this cyber Armageddon coming at them at a various level. Right, starting from like a strategic, let's say, with a CEO and executives, what would they say? What would they do? <clears throat> that it really goes to operations, right? Like how the management would react to it, what the managers would do, and then it really goes to tactical and technical. What the troops on the ground would be actually doing, right? Like how do they collect the evidence? How they preserve the systems? How they try to get attacker out of the systems? and what type of tools they have available to actually get that. What would they need, right, contractually? Like, for example, when they contract with us, like what type of tools then can we provide them, 
right, mm-hmm. at that point of a time. Because think of the modern enterprise as a police station. Right. Right. So you have this big block that's living, breathing organism, right, supporting ecosystem. And then you have this police station to police that big block. Right. But that police station doesn't have a SWAT unit, doesn't have the special forces, doesn't, right, has to call for backup, Mm -hmm. right, when that happens. That's how the organization, so they do prepare for these governing bodies, but they still need to practice, right? How do they work with someone from outside? How would they embed a team, like a special operations team, right, and uh, mimic that type of environment? Right. through the what they call a tabletop mm-hmm. incident response exercise. And, and it really starts from management, right? You need to have mm-hmm. the CEO and everyone first to buy that mission, right? So what would I do in cyber crisis? The challenging piece is probability that each of us is not going to come home today, it's 4%. And it's probably the same probability in our honor age that you're going to be hit by nation state. It's probably less than 10% is probably you're going to be hacked today. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, sure, you're going to be. It's one of the life certainties that it will happen. Mm-hmm. Right? In between the data, our data information is going to be breached. But you just don't know what that extent is. Mm-hmm. Right? It's almost like you're telling me I'm never going to have cold. Right? Yeah. Everyone's going to get a cold. Just the reality. Everyone's data is going to be manipulated, breached, and compromised. You just don't know what extent that mm-hmm. will be. And in your experiences, you know, we talk about rehab and, and the process may be taking two years and so on. Can organizations speed that up by having gone through these sort of tabletop exercises that you're talking about? Or is there another thing that they ought to be doing to try to reduce that rehab? So, you know, if I'm a top athlete and I injure myself, I stand a better chance of recovery within a shorter period of time than the same injury to somebody who perhaps isn't quite as athletic. And uh, does the same apply? Oh, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the same applies. Sure. And you can have access to uh, some different type of medication, stem yeah. cells and everything. Right? Yeah, sure. You can speed up that process. Is it going to be 100%? Maybe not, right? So you still need to give that body, right, that cyber enterprise, time to fully conceal itself. Mm-hmm. The really question is, can you get 95 98% right there quicker? The answer is yes. Right? It's all just so. Uh, and it's not question only of a budget. It's a question of how strategically can you position those products, retrain the troops, right? Mm-hmm. How quickly can you reorganize that unit to be effective? So so people play quite a big role in all of this. It isn't just about the technology. Oh, definitely. Definitely. I think the human talent and engineering is what we are after. Each of us is defined by our code and computers are defined by the code as well. Your show is only good as your DNA, is it? <laughs> I'd like to think we have good DNA. I, I, I like to think. I like to think so. See, so the program, <laughs> so, the, so the program is also think they have a good code DNA. Yeah. And unfortunately, it's like buggy, yeah. a lot of problems, right? So nothing is perfect. No, absolutely. <laughs> that was the first of our two-part conversation with Andre Crahel, CEO and founder of Lifars LLC. Be sure to listen for our second episode in this series of conversations with Andre in which we focus on the threat horizon. So extortion is going to be next level. Basically, to take down an individual today, it's a $500 deal. Mm -hmm. Each of us at the table here. That's it? That's it. Pay $500 and you're debt, digital debt. That's not a lot of money. We know you'll be looking forward to that conversation as much as we are. To find more resources for CISOs and anyone looking to enhance the security of their business, please visit securityforum.org. And we want to hear from you. So if there's somebody you'd like us to speak with, a topic you'd like us to cover, please get in touch through our website at securityforum.org or send us a tweet. Our handle is securityforum as well. We look forward to hearing from you.